Well, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good to see everybody tonight. If you would be opening your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11, and then if you have your book, we're going to be on week number four. We're going to be talking about Noah and his example of faith. Hebrews chapter 11. It is good to see everybody. Hope everybody's having a good week. Good to see Carrie and Jane with us. They are in the process of moving, and they've been back here, back here for a few days, and glad that they have uh, come to see us tonight. Carrie, would you lead our prayer to start our class? You know, people who live along the Atlantic coast and also along the Gulf Coast, they are very well acquainted with hurricanes. With today's technology, meteorologists have become very, very capable of warning people when danger is coming. They're able to tell almost down to the square inch of where the eye of that storm will hit landfall. They can tell you what the intensity level is going to be. They can tell you how long it's going to last, how fast it's going to move, how strong the winds are going to be, how much damage you can expect from it. But most importantly, they're able to warn people of when they need to evacuate. They're able to warn people, you know, this storm is going to be too strong for you to stay put and ride out. You need to move inland. We probably all have seen uh, the news reports at times when hurricanes are coming and you see the large interstate highways and they have both the north and southbound lanes opened up where everyone can move to the north because there's so many people trying to get out of the path of that storm. Would it not be wonderful if mankind would heed the forecasts that God gives to us just as strongly as they heed the forecasts of impending storms? Amen. You stop and you think for just a moment. God's Word tells us that judgment is coming. God's Word tells us that we need to prepare for it. God's Word tells us exactly what we need to do in order to avoid that judgment. Just as we receive threats of impending weather, probably all of us who have smartphones have alerts set up, either from KIT or from some other source, that when there's a tornado warning or a thunderstorm warning, something of that nature, it sends out an alert to us immediately. We have the ability to be on guard we have the ability to take the necessary precautions. Well, we need to understand that when it comes to the Bible, we find even stronger warnings. 
than the ones that we face with these physical calamities of life. For what we find in God's Word, we find warnings of ultimate destruction. Yes, hurricanes, tornadoes, winds, floods, storms, they come along and they do tremendous damage, but they don't destroy the world. They destroy things other than, of course, human life. They destroy things that are able to be rebuilt. But when God's judgment comes, and we have the warning that it is coming, when God's judgment comes, this world is coming to an end. The things that he destroys on that day will not be able to be rebuilt because it will be the end. I want you to think with me just briefly as we enter into this study about some of the words that Paul told those philosophers there on Mars Hill in Athens in Acts 17, verses 30 and 31. He says, Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. The Bible is filled with passages indicating to us, giving us this forecast of future judgment that we need to be prepared. Probably all of us, if we were told that, well, we go back, let's think a few years ago when we had the big floods here in town, and you look at all the preparations that people took who lived in flood-prone areas. They made those preparations. They didn't know how bad it was going to be. They didn't know how far-reaching it would become, but they knew that there was the possibility. Well, we know with a certainty that God's judgment is coming. It's not a possibility. It's a certainty. So why wouldn't we put just as much preparation into getting ready for that? as we would for any other warnings that may come to us in this life. In our lesson text, we find one verse that has so much information packed into it. Dealing with a man by the name of Noah. A man who found grace in the eyes of the Lord. A man who, as we talked about last Sunday morning, was the man whose faith convinced God to spare mankind. God was going to destroy everyone. But then he found Noah. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And mankind was allowed to be spared through Noah and his family. But whenever we look at Noah... Here in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7, Noah is mentioned as an example of great faith. An example of someone who exemplified accepting God's warning, accepting God's directions, and taking those necessary precautions, those steps that were required. But we also, in the story of Noah, find a powerful lesson for us as children of God, and that is that if we will display the same kind of faith, if we will submit to the will of God and obediently respond to God's warnings, then just as Noah and his family were spared from God's judgment in the flood, we will be spared from God's judgment when Jesus comes again. We will receive a heavenly home. We will not be condemned. But it comes down, as we've talked about in each one of these lessons, it comes down to beginning at that foundation of faith. We believe in God, we trust in God, we submit to His will. As a result of that, we live a life that is pleasing to God. Well, in this first verse, or in this one verse that we find pertaining to Noah, we find three different aspects of Noah's faith. More than likely, we're not going to get through all of this tonight. If so, uh, if we do get through all of it, we'll move on into week five next week. If not, we'll look at the second part of this lesson next Wednesday night. 
But like I said, this one verse has so much to say, reveals so much about the faith of Noah, that I really think that we would be remiss if we don't devote the time uh, to addressing this as adequately as we should. And so when we look at this, as I said, we find three aspects of Noah's faith. First, we see the basis of his faith. We see the effects of his faith. And we see the consequences of his faith. And now each one of those three things, we're going to devote some time to talking about and see how that is revealed to us in this passage. But we're also going to see how those things can take place in our life as well. What should be the basis of our faith? What is going to be the effect of us having faith? And then what's the consequence? What's going to come about as a result of our faith? What we're going to find is that these are presented to us as examples to follow. It's not saying these are the things that worked for Noah and you have to find the things that work for you. No, what this is saying is that Noah gives us an example. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord because of his faithfulness, because of his righteousness before God. And so we too can pattern ourselves after that example. Well, let's look at this verse, and then we'll get into our discussion of the basis of Noah's faith. Hebrews 11 and verse 7. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. So when we look at this passage and we ask ourselves, okay, it starts out by telling us that the things that Noah did was by faith. Well, logically, the first question that we need to ask is, okay, how did he develop this faith? What is the basis of this faith? Well, folks, we find that Noah's faith was based upon his trust that God's word would come to fruition. The way he was living his life was because or based upon his understanding that God's word is true. That everything that God speaks is going to take place in due time. And so when God revealed to him that a flood was going to come, he didn't question it. When he revealed to Noah that his judgment was coming upon the world, Noah didn't say, well, I need some time to think about this. Well, God, that's pretty deep. You're talking about something I don't understand. No, he accepted it. He accepted it, and immediately he began to act upon it. But I want you to think about just how strong that faith was when we consider the fact that up to this point it had never rained on the earth. Now you stop and you think for just a moment. God speaks to Noah and he tells him that a worldwide flood is coming. Probably one of the thoughts that entered Noah's mind is what is a flood? What what is a flood? Well, a, a flood is what happens when there's too much rain. Well, what's rain? That's something that's difficult for us to wrap our minds around because it's something we are familiar with. But we know that the Bible teaches that up to this point that the way that the earth was nourished was that a mist came up from the earth. It wasn't rain falling from the sky, but a mist coming up from the earth. So God, you're telling me that water is going to fall from the sky. And it's going to be so much water that it's going to cover the highest mountains on the earth. Okay, I'll accept that. You think about the faith that that must have taken on his part. It's something that had never happened before, that human eyes had never seen. A single drop of rain had never fallen from the sky. 
That leads us to this conclusion. Just as we saw there in Hebrews 11 and verse 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Because you look at the way this describes Noah in verse 7. By faith Noah being divinely warned of what? Of things not yet seen. So what was the only way that he could accept this? What was the only basis for him taking this action? It wasn't based upon sight. It wasn't based upon experience. He had never experienced a flood before. It was based upon faith. He believed that God's word is true. And that whatever God says, even if we don't understand it right now, whatever God's word says... That's what's going to happen. And that's what the writer of Hebrews reveals to us about Noah. It says he did this by faith, even though it was something he had never experienced before. By faith, God warned him that something was going to happen that he had never seen. Well, we too are warned that there is something coming that we have never seen. We've never seen angels coming in the air. We've never seen this earth destroyed by fire. We've never seen the dead coming forth from their graves. We've never seen these things before. But we accept it, don't we? We believe that that's what's going to happen. Why? Because God's Word is true. Because that's what God has revealed to us about things not yet seen. So the basis of Noah's faith was not, oh yeah, I've seen this before. I know this can happen. I've seen the damage that that floods can bring. No. The basis of his belief was he trusted the Word of God. God had never let him down. God had never proven himself to be dishonest. So why would he doubt him now? He trusted in God. And the key thing that I want you to remember from this is is notice that it tells us that this indeed was a warning. But to Noah, if he did not accept that, would it have been a warning to him? The only way that that was a warning to him is if he placed his faith in it. That's why you had all of the other people on the earth that were mocking him, that were criticizing him, that were persecuting him. Because they didn't believe that. They didn't have faith that that was true. So to them, it wasn't a warning. To them, you know, these are the words of a madman. This is impossible. This isn't a warning. He was talking, though, about something that was unprecedented. Something that was unseen. And so the only way that a person could accept that was by faith. Now, after the flood, Noah and his family and every person that has lived on earth since that time, we accept the reality of flooding based upon experience. We don't have to accept that based upon faith because we've seen it. We know the damage that that can cause. But there are other things, as we've already mentioned, where we see warnings of things that are yet unseen, the judgment of God. Any questions or comments up to this point? I know I've talked quite a bit so far. Yes, sir.
water, it washes away the sand and knocks out the first row of houses. Every winter. The people living there are rich and influential, so they holler to the government, build our beaches back. And now the second row becomes the first row, and they build the fourth row behind it. You know how this is going to work. Every year, those people's houses go in the water. The other ones all of a sudden become water. Oh, we've got a water here now. But yet, the rebuilding happens every spring. Is there something wrong with that? <laughs> well, it depends on how you look at it. I mean, like you said, I mean, the ones that are there are extremely wealthy. So, I mean, to them, they don't see it as a big deal. But, you know, I think for most of us, we would look at that kind of as a warning. You know, we probably we probably don't need to have a house here. Not if we have to rebuild it, whatever, four years, if they, the way that. So, yeah, I mean, I would say that that should be a warning to them that that's not ideal. David? I will say this, though. It, it still takes. That's right. And I've had disagreements and arguments with people about the discussion about the flood, and they say, well, you're crazy. It was localized. There's no way that there's that much moisture in the atmosphere or whatever. And I said, well, the Bible says God broke open the fountains of the deep, too. We don't, we can't faith. You have to take by faith that there was enough water from above and from below to do that. But it, it takes really faith on our part still to believe it too. We've seen localized floods, but we've never seen a universal flood. We've got accepted by faith. That's right. I believe it was 22 cubits or whatever above Mount Everest. I really believe it was. Yeah. Well, and kind of going back to the last study we had, and we look at the concept of it from the standpoint of, of science, there have been fossils of aquatic life forms found on top of some of the highest mountains on earth. Right. So what other explanation is there for how that could be? I mean, when you talk about mountains that their peak is miles above sea level, and you're finding the fossils of, of shells and aquatic plants and things of that nature, how else are you going to explain that? Um, of course, that some will try to explain it. They'll say, well, there were earthquakes and that, 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 that at one point was at sea level and the earthquakes caused this and all of that. Well, you know, it's one of those things that we've talked about. You know, it ta- in my opinion, it takes more faith to accept evolution and some of the other scientific explanations than it does to accept what God's Word says. It just, there's so many things there that they don't explain adequately how those things could have come about. And so I think that's why you see so many people in the world that they don't necessarily claim to be a Christian or claim to be an atheist. They claim to be somewhere in the middle because they say, well, we've not got enough information yet to establish our belief one way or the other. And and on one hand, we can kind of understand that on one hand. But on another hand, we have to make a decision. I mean, this is a a case where we have to decide what we're going to believe. But one of the things, coming back to our lesson, that I wanted to mention, you know, I share a lot of things from the book of Ecclesiastes. I think Ecclesiastes is such a powerful book talking about how we come to realize that true blessings are not able to be found in the things of this world. And Solomon gives us a great example from his own life of how he went out and he tried everything under the sun, using his terminology. He tried everything that was out there trying to find lasting pleasure. He couldn't find it. He found that it was all vanity. It was empty, nothing there. Yes, it may bring temporary pleasure, But one of the things that Solomon talks about is that those who are under the sun are trying to find purpose in life without faith. 
They're trying to find some way to apply value and meaning to human existence without considering the fact that we are here because God created us. We are here to fulfill God's will, not our own will. But Solomon, after trying all of these different things, he came to the realization that if you are trying to determine the course of human life without consideration for God, that it's sheer folly, it's foolishness to do so. Because he came to the understanding, based upon his experiences, he came to the understanding that the whole duty of man is what? And y'all speak up. Fear God and keep His commandments. It's not about finding purpose in the things of this world. It's not seeking pleasure from the things of this world. But how do we attain those things? We fear God and we keep His commandments. He said, that's the whole duty of man. But faith allows us to hear and believe the Word of the unseen God. Have any of us ever seen God with the naked eye? Have any of us ever heard the audible voice of God? No. Have any of us ever felt the physical touch of God? No, we've never experienced God in an empirical or sensory way. So what causes us to believe that God exists, what causes us to believe that the Bible is His inspired Word, what causes us to believe that Jesus is His Son? Faith. Faith. Faith is also what allows up to lay up those treasures in heaven. Those things that are going to speak for us on the day of judgment, those things that are going to determine our righteousness before God. Remember Jesus said in Matthew 6, 19 through 21, He says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Where neither moth nor rust destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We also find a passage from the Apostle Paul, and this is one that every time I hear this passage, it causes me to, to really stop and consider what the ramifications are that Paul is saying. He makes the statement that, If there's not going to be a resurrection, if God does not exist, and I'm paraphrasing, if the Bible is not truly God's Word, if there's not an eternal home in heaven with God, if all of that is a myth, then those who have faith are what? They are of all men most miserable. Because what he is alluding to in that He says, you know, if none of those things are true, then we are removing that source of joy, which would be the world. We're not going out seeking joy and, and, and peace and all of these things, although it's temporary. We're not going out and seeking any of that because we're placing our faith in God and in His Word. Well, if we die and we find out none of that is true... What a miserable state that's going to be. Now, Paul did not make this statement to put doubt in people's minds. Paul made this statement to show us that those who accept these things by faith, that faith one day is going to become sight. Those things that we've placed our faith into... One day, it will be revealed to us when this life comes to an end that those things that we've believed, those things that we've worked so hard to to accomplish, they're going to pay off because we've laid up those treasures in heaven. We're going to receive that heavenly home as a result of our faithfulness to God. But also... 
When we think about those people in the days of Noah, those who did not accept his message. You know, he spent 120 years warning people. 120 years preaching, amassing the materials, working on the ark, bringing all of these animals in. And people were there seeing this day in and day out, hearing the things that he had to say. And all along, this guy's crazy. This, this man don't know what he's talking about. He's living like he really believes the things that he's saying. Well, the world's going to say that about us too, aren't they? Because if we truly are children of God, we're going to be living like we really believe what we're saying. We really believe that God exists. We really believe that the Bible is His Word. We really believe that Jesus has gone to prepare a heavenly home for us. We really believe that. Now the world's going to look at us and believe we're crazy. But look at the example of Noah. Who was spared and who was lost? Those who believed in God were spared. Those who doubted, they were lost. But also, we see another point. We see in the story of Noah that just because God's judgment was delayed, it does not mean that God had changed his mind. I want you to think about some of the examples that we see in the New Testament. You know, there were those who just a, a, a very short time after the church came into establishment who were starting to, to address this concept of the second coming. You know, why hasn't he come back? He said he's coming back. Why isn't he here? He said that he's coming back with judgment. Why, why are we still here? Why has nothing changed? You think there were those in the days of Noah that after 5, 10, 20 years... They'd come by every day. Where's the rain? It's not raining yet. You're crazy. Well, when 120 years passed by, and the door of the ark was closed, and that first drop of rain hit the earth, they understood that they were wrong. But they had waited too long. God was not willing to wait on them to operate based upon sight. He wanted them to operate based on faith. Believe the things that I say are true. Yes, sir. That's a good point. Yeah. Well, and you know, I've also heard people make the argument, you know, if, if that is the case, you know, we've still lived the best life that we could live. But once again, we need to understand that's not the point that, that he's making there. You know, he's, he's talking to people trying to motivate them to have faith. He said, yeah, there are people that say, and you're crazy. There are people that are saying, don't believe this. He said, but think about it this way. And, and, of course, I'm paraphrasing. I'm giving you the Randolph County, Arkansas version. He, he, he said, you know, he said, if you truly are going to reject this and not place your faith in this, what happens if you die and it is true? That's the point that he's making. It's not turning this around saying, well, you've wasted your life if you've lived a Christian life and then you find out it's not true. No, that's not what he's saying at all. He's saying, what if you've been wrong? What if 
you've rejected God. Those in the day of Noah found out too late. They lost their lives in the flood. And sadly, there are going to be many people when Jesus comes again who are going to be unprepared. But a statement that you've heard me say many times, on the day of judgment there will be no atheists. Because we are told that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. But for so many it will be too late. They're not going to have an opportunity to believe at that point. Because God wants us to operate on faith. All right, we're going to stop there for tonight. Lord willing, next Wednesday night we'll pick back up in this same verse and we'll continue talking about some of these aspects of Noah's faith.